six times higher, 20 times greater. That's what the theory of disruption indicates will happen when you pursue a disruptive course. Your odds of success will be six times higher, your revenue opportunity 20 times greater for your company and for you. You don't need to cope with the force of disruption. You can harness its power and unpredictability to propel you forward, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. I'm going to start by telling you a story. In 2005, I was working as an equity analyst at Merrill Lynch, and it was my job to issue buy and sell recommendations on stocks like America Mobile, which is the fourth largest cellular company in the world. One day I said to one of my very dear friends, I'm quitting my job. Whitney, have you lost your mind? I knew it was time to go, but it was completely illogical because I was at the top of my game. I had just come back from Mexico for an investor day for America Mobile, and as I sat in the audience, hundreds of other people, Carlos Slim, the controlling shareholder and one of the world's richest people, he trades places with Bill Gates, was quoting my research. He referred to me as La Whitney. <laughs> I had institutions like Fidelity asking me for my financial models, and when I would upgrade or downgrade a stock, it would typically move several percentage points. Not only was I at the top of my game, but getting to this place of power and respect had been hard won. Fifteen years earlier, I had arrived in New York with my husband so he could pursue his PhD at Columbia. As we drove across the George Washington Bridge into Manhattan, I was terrified. I would never have gone to New York on my own. There were so many buildings, such, such, so many people, crime, drugs, horror stories. And for the first week, I wouldn't go anywhere by myself. But we had to put food on the table, so I eventually had to go out of our 17th floor student housing apartment and get a job. I was a music major, so I decided to work on Wall Street. <laughs> because in a course, as I had no connections in New York and clearly very little confidence, I started working as a secretary for a retail sales broker at Smith Barney in Midtown Manhattan. It was an exciting, exciting time to be on Wall Street. It was the era of liar's poker, of bonfire of the vanities, of working girl. And as I started to work, I didn't just want to work. I wanted to work on Wall Street. So I started taking business courses at night. And then I had a boss who believed in me, which allowed me to move up from secretary to investment banker, which if you've worked on Wall Street, you know this rarely happens. Then a step back to become an equity analyst. And eventually, I co-founded an investment firm with Clayton Christensen at the Harvard Business School. I would not have known to call it this then. But when I walked onto Wall Street through the secretarial side door, and when I walked off of Wall Street to become an entrepreneur, I was a disruptor. Disruptive innovation <coughs> is a term coined by Clay Christensen to describe a low-end or new market innovation that eventually upends an industry. In my case, I'd started at the bottom, climbed to the top, and now I wanted to upend my career. <laughs> According to the theory, a disruptor secures a foothold at the low end of the market. Think Amazon in the 90s, and its products are inferior, very low quality. Initially, its position is weak. Barnes and Noble and Borders could have crushed them like a cockroach, but they didn't. Market leaders, they rarely bother. It's just this silly little thing. Let's go after bigger, faster, better. The problem is, is that once the disruptor gains a foothold, it too is motivated by bigger, faster, better. And by the time it does make sense to mount a counterattack, say it with me, it's too late. <laughs> to be fair, low-end disruptors, they're really easy to miss. In 2002, I started to build my model on America Mobile. And the question I had to ask was, wireless penetration, what can it do in the future? At this point in time, wireline penetration in Mexico was 15%. Wireless penetration was 25%, up from just 1% five years earlier. So how much more could it actually grow? Well, based on the demographics, how many people could afford a high-end phone and who had access to credit, I thought maybe, possibly, maybe, penetration can get to 40% or 40 million people. 
Enter Carlos Slim. He saw a much, much bigger opportunity. Sure, he saw the 40% or 40 million people I saw, but he saw another 50% or 50 million people who wanted to be connected but couldn't afford to. So what does Carlos Slim do? He offers them subsidized handsets, prepaid cards. Sound quality is bad for this silly little product, but bad sounds better than no sound. Well, today, wireline penetration has increased a paltry five percentage points from 15 to 20 percent. Wireless penetration has increased from 25 percent not to 40 percent, but to 90 percent. Yeah, you were doing the math, good. One of the reasons that disruption is so hard to spot is because of the timing. Growth could be completely flat for years and then suddenly spike upward. Wireless was introduced in Mexico in 1988. Penetration was less than 1% for a decade. And then from 1997 to 2002, foomp, up to 25%. When an industry is in upheaval, booyah, say the 50% or 50 million people who are now connected. But for the individual experiencing a seismic shift in what the world looks like, it can be pretty unsettling. It can also be an amazing ride. Each of us has a view of the world powered by personal algorithms. We take a look at how all the individual components of our personal social system interact. We try to come up with patterns to predict what will happen next. When systems behave linearly and react immediately, we're fairly accurate with our forecast. You flip a switch, the light goes on. But when they don't, our predictive power plummets. One of the best ways to make sense of this non-linear world is the S-curve. Just as the S-curve helps us gauge how quickly an innovation will be adopted, it also helps us deal with these time delays, providing milestones that we can watch for. We know that at the outset, growth will be slow. Once a tipping point is reached, which is typically 10 to 15 percent, you move into hypergrowth, and then at 90 percent or saturation, growth tapers off. Facebook, for example. Assuming a market opportunity of a billion people, which it's now exceeded, it took Facebook nearly four years to reach 100 million users. But once it reached that tipping point of 10 to 15 percent, it entered hypergrowth. And over the next four years, it added not 100 million, but 800 million users. Now, we can quibble over whether or not it has reached saturation, but there is no question that the rate of growth has begun to slow. Now, what I find really exciting, fascinating, encouraging about the S-curve is it also helps us understand the psychology of disruption. If you, for example, just started a new job, a new role, a new business, the S-curve tells you that initially progress will be quite slow, and this helps you avoid discouragement. Then, as you put in the time, the effort, the practice, you accelerate into competence and confidence. And this is the exciting part of the S-curve where all of your synapses are firing. As you approach mastery, you'll be able to do your job really, really easily. But because you're no longer enjoying the feel-good effects of learning, boredom and complacency can kick in. If at this point you don't jump to a new curve, your plateau can become a precipice. There are volumes of research indicating that the odds of success improve for companies, countries, products, services. But the fundamental unit of disruption is the individual. The best way to drive corporate or organizational innovation is through personal disruption. And if you can learn to ride these S-curve waves of learning and mastering, you will have a competitive advantage in an era of accelerating disruption. I've identified seven variables that will help move your movement along these curves. And the first is to take the right risks. Two kinds of risks I want to talk about. The first is competitive risk. The second is market risk. Competitive risk. If a colleague comes to you and says, there's a huge market opportunity out there and I have got the projections to prove it, it's likely a competitor is already out there. Kingpin, it ain't you. And you have to decide if you can compete and win. That's competitive risk. If a colleague comes to you and says, 
I don't know if there's a market. I don't. But I think that there's a need not being met. You don't know if there are customers, but there's no competition either. So as a first mover, if there are customers, you're favored to own the market. That's market risk. So how does this apply to individuals? Right after my son, who's now 19, was born, I was hired to do into equity research. And I was hired to cover the cement and construction sector. Believe it or not, I was really excited. I'd started to build my financial models and so, small, small, I can't even say it. Solomon Brothers and Smith Barney announced a merger. And guess what? They already had a highly ranked cement and construction analyst. Those cement shoes you're handing me, boss. However, there were a number of media companies going public, no analysts to cover them. As the theory of disruption would dictate, rather than knocking on a cement door that was closed, I built my own media door, and within a year, I too was a ranked analyst. Now here's the rub. Competitive risk feels, it feels less risky because it's more certain. But if you can learn to deal with the uncertainty of market risk, then you can walk through that door of opportunity <coughs> as you play to your distinctive strengths. And that's number two. A distinctive strength being something that you do well that others in your sphere do not. Janie Juvan, who I'm going to embarrass for just a moment, she played to her distinctive strengths. As a third year associate at her law firm, she decided to start using social media. Well, law firms don't tend to do things that are, they tend to be fairly conservative. And it was 10 years ago, so they didn't really see the market opportunity, but she said, you know, I think there's something here. I'm going to keep going. Well, she kept going. And in 2007, 2008, when the economy came crashing down, she was able to sidestep layoffs because she had landed clients on social media. And she was able to make a very compelling case to become partner, again, because of social media. Now, this fish out of water story, that's after the fact. One of the things many of us struggle with is, what are my strengths in the first place? So I'm going to give you a few clues. Number one, what makes you feel strong? Marcus Buckingham said, our strengths clamber for our attention in the most basic way. Using them makes you feel strong. You feel inquisitive, invigorated, successful. Number two, what exasperates you? The frustration of genius is in believing if it's easy for you, it must be easy for everybody else. It may not be that the people around you are incompetent, though they may be. It just may be that you are prodigy-like in this one area. You do not know how to tell people how, what you want done because you don't know how you know. So the next time you're exasperated, consider the possibility that you and your colleagues are bumping up against your genius. <laughs> Number three, what compliments do you dismiss? These are the compliments that you've heard so many times you actually ignore them because they're for you as natural as breathing. Or it may be that you think to yourself, you know, I've heard this compliment so many times. Why can't they compliment me on that other thing that I worked so, so, so very hard to do? Well, that thing they're complimenting you on that's as natural as breathing, that's one of your greatest strengths. It's important to play to it. But people, we tend to overvalue what we aren't, undervalue what we are, and as a consequence, we are not able to move up the curve quite as quickly. If you want to be successful, bring your superpowers to work. Number three, embrace constraints. Whenever we're trying something new, we want and we need lots and lots of feedback. Think about skateboarders. They're some of the quickest learners in the world because they receive incredibly fast and useful feedback. <laughs> every action, every move has an immediate consequence. One of the biggest constraints that most of us face is money, which is usually a good thing because if it's do or don't eat, you're pretty incentivized to get the business model right, all you entrepreneurs. Great study done about 10 years ago. It was in Entrepreneur Magazine. About two, they, they made a list of the 500 fastest growing companies in the United States. What caught my attention was how these companies funded their growth. 